Um, uh, yeah, I'm all over the program, but uh, this is the last uh, session for me, I promise. <laughs> so, um, we're moving on in our exploration of Wikidata. Yesterday we got introduced to Wikidata, and today we learned how to query it, or at least the beginnings of our querying skills. Uh, those of you who haven't had a chance yet, look at my slides that I sent. They have quite amazing examples of the kinds of things you can do with Wikidata. Um, and remember, you don't have to understand the query to use it. If it does what you more or less what you want and you just need to change the country or the language or the type, the item type or something, just do it, just change it, even without understanding the rest. And it can work for you. So now we come to another layer, another kind of data that can uh, exist in Wikidata. And this is the lexicographical layer, the layer dealing with defining and describing words like a dictionary does. And that layer is fondly known as lexeme, because that's easier to say than the lexicographical layer of Wikidata. Lexeme. So this is a typical desk of a lexeme contributor with a lot of dictionaries and things. Uh, ooh, I have a thing. I'm going to use the thingy. So I want to start with a question that's on your minds. My psychic powers are telling me. You're, you're wondering, what is this lexeme and why do I need it in my life? So I want to tell you that you are lucky. And I used to tell six years ago when I started talking about Wikidata, I would tell people, you are lucky because you get to be a Wikidata hipster. Because one day, in a few years, Wikidata will become mainstream and people will use it and people will build on it. And then you will be able to say, oh yeah, Wikidata. I edited it before it was cool. You'd be a Wikidata hipster. Unfortunately, that time is over. It is too late to become a Wikidata hipster now. We have 100 million items. Wikidata is used all over the world, not just by Wikimedians, by libraries, by, by museums, by governments. Uh, so it's too late, I'm afraid, to become a Wikidata hipster. However, you can still become a Lexeme hipster, because Lexeme is still relatively new. It's only two, three years old, and uh, most people haven't really understood it yet, haven't really started working with it yet. So you are in an excellent position. You, in this room, are in an excellent position to become Lexeme hipsters, possibly the first Lexeme hipsters in your country. So you're lucky. And you would be able to say, you know, two or three years on, when Lexeme becomes very well known, you would be able to say, oh yeah, Lexeme. I edited it back in 2022. So uh, this is your chance to become a Lexeme hipster. Okay, but why? Why would we want to become Lexeme hipsters? And the main reason is that computers can provide... A lot of value can do wonderful things for us um, with human language. They can help us in human language acquisition, in learning a language, and practicing it, and analyzing long texts. They can do all that very well for us as computers. They can even help us with translation. But they can do that if they have structured data about human language. You've already heard me this morning calling human language squishy, right? It's kind of soft and has lots of meanings and edge cases. It's not very structured. Uh, computers need things to be structured in order to be useful. So <clears throat> human languages being really complex makes it a challenge for computers to be as useful as they could be for us in, say, Uzbek, because computers don't know much about the Uzbek language or about any language. They don't know enough about any language. Now, I also want to address 
my psychic powers tell me that some of you maybe think, well, language is not that complex. You know, it's, it's one word in this language, it's another word in another language. Why is it so complex? So just to address anyone who may think that in this room, let me ask you a question. What does dog mean in English? The verb or the noun? Mm. <laughs> yeah, good question. So dog, you know, woof woof, animal, right? You know the word dog, right? And that's probably what you were all thinking of when I said dog, if you speak any English. You probably know the word dog and you were thinking about the animal that goes woof woof or hav hav or whatever it goes in your language, right? Um, but in English... Dog can also be a verb. Maybe some of you didn't know this, but in English, dog can also be a verb that means to follow or stalk someone. Like a hunting dog, maybe. Like, that's the connection. But when people say to dog someone, guilt began to dog the thief day and night. That's a sentence in English that most native English speakers would understand and not think about dogs. I mean, they would not think about animals going woof woof. They would understand this to mean that guilt, the emotion guilt, was chasing this person, was burdening this person day and night without thinking about the animal. Their brains are ready to accept the word dog in two very different senses, and they do it naturally. And of course, there are examples of this in your languages as well. I you know, uh, usually try to give examples from the local language in my talk, but there are many languages in this room, and I don't know any of them. So um, I'm giving English examples. But you can imagine such words in your language. Just to give another example in English, what does bat mean? Like Batman, right? Uh, but it also means a, a stick, right? like a baseball bat, right? A stick. So the owner hit the burglar with a baseball bat. Doesn't mean the animal that sleeps upside down, right? These are, again, uh, this time it's, it's a noun. The bat, the word bat for animal is a noun. And this is also a noun. It's just a very different noun. It's describing a completely different object, right, than the animal. Again, no problem for native speakers. We understand that this sentence is not talking about an animal because we have two things. We have context. The word baseball here is very good context, right? And we have intelligence. Our human intelligence allows us to uh, understand the, the correct sense. By the way, even if it didn't say baseball here, and you read the sentence that said, the owner hit the burglar with a bat... If you know the word bat in this sense of a stick, you would still understand that he hit him with a stick. He didn't just grab a bat that was sleeping there and hit the burglar, right? Why, do we, why are we so sure? Common sense, right? We have common sense. We have intelligence. We have no, tr no trouble. Uh, and again, for, for learners and people with, with uh, a lot less English, it might be confusing. Maybe they only know the meaning of the animal, bat. And then this sentence is really confusing. And we all know this when we try to learn new languages. Some things don't make sense, you know, until we go, ah, wait, there's another meaning, you know. But for a native speaker, there's no difficulty. You know both senses, you pick the right one because you have the intelligence. And uh, we could go on with examples just to give you a verb example. The verb to mean. What does mean mean? Well, it means to have a meaning, right? It means to, to, to express some, some content, right? But it also, it also means someone nasty, right? He was a mean old man, right? Nasty, cruel. And it also means average, right? The mean income in her country is lower. The mean income. Uh, nothing to do with meaning, right? It's, it's a different sense. Um, so how do we know how to translate? How do our lovely translators up there know how to translate the word mean when I use it? When I said, what does dog mean? I hope none of our translators translated nasty. The word mean. Right? They used the word mean, like, I don't know, oznachaya, right, in, in uh, Ukrainian. I don't know how to say it in Turkish. Uh, they used an appropriate word because the context was clear. 
So context and intelligence are what allow us to deal with the complexity of words. But words are complex, and what they mean is complex. But wait, my psychic powers tell me. Machine translation does exist. Computers can translate texts, and they do, right? We all use machine translation, right? All of us, we, we, it's so useful. We all use machine translation now and then. So why are you saying it's so complicated? Machine translation does exist, and it does produce a text, but those of us who have used machine translation a lot can also tell you horror stories, right, of just how wrong the machine translation got the text. Not just missing a nuance, like, oh, I would have translated it a little differently, but like completely reversing the meaning of a sentence, right? Have you encountered that? Where the sentence says, I don't know, A is not B, and then the translation says A is B. Like completely the opposite, literally. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen with machine translation. And sometimes it's just picked the wrong meaning, you know, the wrong meaning of dog or the wrong meaning of bat, because it didn't have enough context and it doesn't have any intelligence, machine translation. And then we get nonsensical texts. Right? Complete nonsense. And it's to the point that sometimes it's hard to understand. Now, sometimes we manage to understand anyway. Why? Because we do have intelligence. So when we find out that the owner hit the burglar with a you know, flying rat, you know, with a bat, and we go, what? Oh, wait, but this is English. So the, pro- the word was probably bat. And okay, now I get it. He hit him with a baseball bat. We are capable of figuring that out if we know something about the source language using our intelligence. But the machine translation cannot. That's why we need actual awesome translators like the ones up there. Because there's no, still, there is still no um, uh, substitute for human intelligence in the complex act of translating. But machine translation is useful for what we do use it for, right? To get the general idea of a text, if someone sent us a letter in a language we completely don't understand, machine translation can at least you know, help us understand whether it's spam you know, or an actual letter. Or maybe we need just a, just a detail like, I don't know, like a street name or a city, and that we can get from machine translation. So I'm not saying machine translation is useless, stop using it. No, it is useful for what it is useful for. But here, in this context of lexeme, I want you to notice that machine translation, because it is based on a statistical approach, I don't know if you know, the way machine translation works in Google, in in DeepL, in all those uh, good machine translation engines, is by creating massive, massive, massive corpora, or corpuses, right, of texts, some of them parallel, like some of them they know this is a translation of that, and then mashing them all together with sophisticated statistical algorithms to create what we know as machine translation, right? Pretty good, except for the parts where it's terrible, (laughs) right? That's what we get from the statistical approach. And again, it's good enough for some of the things we use it for. But I want you to notice that this good enough text that we get from machine translation is also a flat text. It loses a lot of nuance and tone and flavor from the original, right? If the original had a style, you know, a literary style, or a tone, or used some slang words, or some some regional words, that will all be lost in the machine translation, which will go for the statistically likely word, which is, you know, kind of the flattest possible translation, rather than preserving some archaism, right? Like some some note of uh, uh, archaic language in the... In <coughs> Excuse me, in the uh, text, or 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 the style of the author, and that's why we can basically never machine translate poetry. Have you ever tried? I mean, it does not work. Nobody would want to read the poetry that machine translation produces. So, I want you to think about one more thing in, about machine translation. Recently, I noticed in the last few months, I noticed that machine translation sometimes translates across languages. Meaning, you tell it, for example, 
I don't know, um, this text is in Ukrainian, and it translates some words in Ukrainian as though they were Russian. Even though you said, this is a Ukrainian text, now give it to me in English. Google Translate, for some words, will actually give you the Russian meaning of that word instead of the Ukrainian meaning. Why? Because of statistics. Because it encountered it a lot more in Russian than in Ukrainian, for example. And it does this silently. I mean, I noticed it because I know some Ukrainian and I don't know Russian. So I noticed it. But many people won't. If they don't know enough about Ukrainian, they won't notice it at all. And they would get some, you know, translation mistakes silently using this um, statistical approach. So we're not only losing tone and style. Sometimes we're literally, because of this massive statistical algorithm, we're literally even uh, um, mistranslating by misidentifying the language. So, yes, machine translation works, but it is nowhere near good enough for what we might call a, an adequate translation, a quality translation that really gets at the meaning of the original, not to mention all the dimensions beyond the meaning, the tone, the nuance, the, the feel, uh, how, how new or old the language feels, etc. None of that we will get from machine translation. So language is complex, and I will very quickly just go through just how complex it is. First, words have many forms. We know this in Turkish and the other languages you speak here, Russian, etc., that a single word has different forms depending on whether it's singular or plural. Uh, in some languages, whether what its uh, role in the sentence is, right? Whether it's the subject or the object, right? Um, it changes. Do you know what I mean? Cases, right? What's the term for cases in, uh, I don't know, in Russian or Turkish? Uh, the translators can maybe contribute those terms, uh, right? So you have nominative and genitive and dative, etc., in languages that have cases. Um, some languages have genders, right, for, for words. So a word is either masculine or feminine or neuter sometimes, like in Russian, for example, right? Uh, not just people, right? Like the table, the, the window is masculine or feminine or neuter. Some words are irregular. So we have some rules for how to conjugate a verb, and then some verbs are irregular. For instance, in English, you probably know this example. The verb to go in the past is not goed, as we might expect, right? It's went. I went. Why? It's a completely different form, right? It's actually a different verb, by the way. The original uh, English verb was wend, and the past of it was went. And at some point, the different verb go kind of merged with the verb wend and took its past form. So we know nobody says wend anymore for the present, but the verb go uses the past of wend. Uh, that's just how it is, you know, and all languages have these, all right, like uh, irregular verbs, irregular words, that's complex. Now, in addition to a particular word having a lot of forms, it can also have many senses, and this we gave examples of already, right, with a dog and the bat and other examples you can give. Um, my favorite uh, psychic powers gave me an example of a Turkish word, yüzmek. What does yüzmek mean? What? To swim. Excellent. And that's the only thing it means? No. It also means to peel, right? To skin something. So these are very different things, right? You cannot easily see how one comes from the other, but they're two different meanings of this Turkish word. And if I were learning Turkish, and I would go, oh, yüzmek, swimming, great. And, and someone would tell me, I don't know, to do it to an orange, I would go, uh, what? What? What do you want me to do with the orange? How do I swim an orange? Right? It's, it's very confusing. But again, to people who speak Turkish, no problem. It's just another sense of that word. So words have many senses. And some of those senses are more common. And some of them are maybe found only in literature. Or maybe in old you know, Ottoman Turkish. And not really used today. Um, and some of them are maybe regional. Right? Some of them are maybe used, I don't know, only in eastern Turkey and not really here in Istanbul, uh, etc. 
not only do words have many senses, but senses have many words, right? A certain meaning could have more than one word to describe it, right? In English, we can say peak or we can say summit. Both mean the top of like a mountain or something, right? These are two completely different words that have the same sense. So we were talking about one word having two senses, but also the same sense could be described by two words, right? In your language as well. Clever or smart. These are synonyms, right? We call them synonyms. Words that mean the same thing or almost the same thing, right? Sometimes synonyms are eh, kind of synonyms, but if you use one, you sound educated. And if you use another one, you sound less educated, for example, right? They, they mean the same thing, but still, they're not exactly equal. Not exactly equal. Uh, then we have homophones, words that sound the same. Right? In English, to steal, to take without permission, versus the material steel, right? Made from steel. They sound the same, but they're not spelt the same. But when you hear me speak, you can't know which one I'm saying. You need context and intelligence, right? Uh, and some things don't sound the same, but are written the same. Who can tell me how to read the thing in parentheses there? Actually, it's read and read. <laughs> I'm kidding. There's no way to tell, right? There's no way to tell. Yes, the two forms are read and read. But when you see it written, you don't know which one I wrote you know, before, uh, before the other, right? Uh, um, that's exactly it. They're different words. They have different meanings. In this case, in the present or in the past, right? I'm, I, I want to read the book or I read the book, right? Spelt the same doesn't mean the same thing and doesn't sound the same. Um, not to mention even more uh, complicated uh, phenomena like the register of the language, meaning how, uh, like I said, do you sound more educated or more formal or less? Is it slang? Is it uh, you know only literary? And using it in the kiosk would be weird, right? Uh, but we all know this, right? I mean, in our native languages at least. We know naturally which register of the word to use when we're in the market or when we're, I don't know, uh, at work, right? We're using different words intuitively, instinctively. But if we're trying to describe language, we need some way to be able to say, oh, this word is different from that word, even though they mean the same thing. I need a way to describe it, and the term that linguists use is register. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm going to skip a few examples, but all of this, all of these examples that I gave are just at the single word level. We didn't even get into the complexity of sentences, right? With clauses and conditionals and all the things that can come with sentences. We're leaving all that aside. We're talking about words right now. So it sounds like it's going to be complex to model all this complexity in structured data, right? Right. It is going to be complex, but I want to suggest to you that it's worth it. It's worth the effort, because if and when we, all of us, document our languages in a structured way in Wikidata, there's going to be a wealth of uses, of applications and tools and games that we would be able to build on top of it. Just like my colleague Luca was telling us about uh, multimedia, right? The, the more we describe the media on commons, the more we can get back from commons, the more we can discover things we had no idea were even there. And I'm especially excited, not just about the uses I already know about or can imagine, I'm especially excited about the uses I can't even imagine. Things right now I cannot imagine people will do, but once we document our languages on Lexeme, we will start seeing those amazing inventions that I couldn't think of. Right? So that's exciting. I want to give you some examples of what can be done with structured data on, on uh, language. 
So we could create all kinds of language learning tools. For example, a flashcard app. Most of you probably know flashcards, right? You to memorize words, and there are such apps, right? But every app has to kind of have its own little database, and sometimes they're not very good, and sometimes they're not very accurate. I personally, when I was trying to learn languages, sometimes found apps that were, frankly, uh, terrible. You know, they, I don't know who collected them. Maybe they were using machine translation, and then I, the human, was trying to learn a language with flashcards that were made with machine translation. That's terrible. Don't do it. <laughs> you'll, you'll learn the wrong things, you know? So if we have human-curated structured data about language, we can create responsible flashcard apps trivially. I mean, to the programmers among you, it, you can probably imagine that given a database, a flashcard app is really simple. It's, it's, there's nothing to it. Um, we can create tools to practice our grammar, you know, that would kind of quiz us. Like, give me this verb in the third person singular past, you know, and I have to type the form. Or maybe I, I'm given the form and I have to identify, oh, this is a present, simple, whatever, right? We can easily build such things. We can create educational games based on words and connecting them to uh, images, by the way. We can have pronunciation practice because the lexicographical layer on Wikidata can include audio. So we can easily create an app or maybe combine it with the flashcards, you know, so that the flashcard also speaks the word in a native speaker accent so that I can improve my Turkish accent, which is terrible, right? Um, and, of course, we can um, contribute to accessibility, to uh, text-to-speech software, things that help uh, the blind, uh, etc. And that's all just in language uh, acquisition. We can also have um, better tools for spell checking, for grammar checking. We can have crossword solvers. You like crosswords? Yeah, we can have crossword solvers based on, because Lexeme will know how long the word is and what form it is, etc., and what it's about. <clears throat> and we can have many more tools that I don't have time to go into, but if you are a word nerd and these two uh, words are exciting to you, stylometry, stematology, phylometry, I'm a word nerd, so I'm happy to talk to you afterwards during the break about these other possibilities. And of course translation, because as we saw, correct translation depends on distinguishing the particular sense of the original uh, word, contextualizing it within the text that it's in and the tone and the register that is appropriate, <clears throat> and then selecting uh, an appropriate word in the uh, target language. And any professional translator will tell you, and even uh, those of you who have done translators, translations as, am as uh, amateurs, as volunteers, will know translation is very far from looking up a word in some list and going, oh, okay, and this is the word in the other language, one-to-one, -one, right? It's never that simple. But a lot of people who haven't ever done translation kind of imagine that that's what translators do. You know, they have a big dictionary and they just look up a word and they copy whatever the other word is, right? That's translation. So, having established that language is really complex, let's make a wish. Let's wish upon a star. What if, and you already know where this is going, what if we could describe lexemes. Lexemes, uh, lexema in Greek, right, is a, is a unit of meaning. Uh, what if we could describe lexemes very precisely down to the specific forms and different senses that each word, each lexeme may have, so that we could say, this particular form is the nominative, but that form is the genitive. And this verb form is imperfect, but that one is pluperfect, and whatever other features your language has. And what if we could say that this word is regional, and say what region? And what if we could say this is old Turkish, this is Ottoman Turkish, you know, it's, it's archaic, it's not in use today. Or this is slang, this is, you know, maybe a, 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 an obscene term that you shouldn't use if you're building an educational game for children, for example. We need to tell the computer that, <laughs> otherwise it could use that word. Um, 
And what if we were able to say that this sense of the word yuzmek translates to English as swimming, but this other sense of the word translates as to peel, right? I need a way to express all that in a structured way. What if we could also say that this lexeme is a combination of these other lexemes? And languages like Turkish like to build words from other words, right? Like to have uh, agglutinated words. So it's especially relevant for Turkish. But uh, just saying, I don't know, um, a word like cash flow, right? In English. Cash flow, written as one word, is made up of two words, right? Cash and flow each of them having a meaning, but together they also mean something specific in business, right? Cash flow. So we want a way to say cash flow is a word that has meanings, but also it's made up of the word cash and of the word flow. We want to link it, link it to other lexemes. What if we want to be able to say that a certain word is borrowed from another language? Imagine my joy when I speak no Turkish and I saw at the airport that the um, uh, escalator is called an ascenseur. I know that word from French. And that's where Turkish got it, right? So we can document that. Oh, this word comes from the French ascenseur, right? Um, what if we could s connect words to the Wikidata concepts that they stand for, right? Wikidata, for example, has an item about swimming, like the act of swimming. Remember we saw it yesterday when we were building an item about the, the Paralympic swimmer. What if we could say yizmek is the Turkish word for that, for that concept. In Wikidata, remember, there's only one item for swimming. Just one item. It has many labels, right? But there's only one item. But in Lexeme, when we document our lexicons in all our different languages and dialects, etc., we can create all the forms and all the meanings and then connect them centrally to that item for the concept. Not the term, not the word used, but the concept, the platonic idea of swimming. Also, what if we could provide example sentences, like a good dictionary does, right? It doesn't just tell you this is the form and this is the meaning. It also gives you an example, like a natural sentence where the word happens. And, and many of us have known this, right? When we look things up in a dictionary, sometimes we read the description and we are not sure we got it. But then we read a sentence and we go, ah, okay, now I understand. The sentence helps, you know, the natural sentence helps uh, demonstrate it. What if we could create example sentences that demonstrate the different senses of the word. So one example sentence for swimming and another example sentence for peeling. What if we could also attach audio so that we know how to pronounce the word, right? And we, we can play it. And what if we could query all of that and start asking questions about our whole lexicon. What if we could ask things like, what are some nouns that are masculine in Ukrainian, but feminine in German? That might be an interesting thing to ask. Why would it be interesting? Because if Ukrainian is my native language and I'm trying to learn German, one of the problems is that uh, a table may be uh, feminine in Ukrainian and masculine in German, or vice versa. So my intuition on, on the gender of things might be wrong and I have to memorize it. So this might be a good list of those nouns where the languages don't agree on the gender. So these are the specially important nouns for me to learn, right? Because that's where I'm likely to make a mistake. Are you following me? Or am I too... Uh, far in my excitement about language. So this is, this is a query, a Wikidata query that can give me a study list, can help me study German or, or any language of course. We could also create like a nice graph of the etymology of the word horse in the Slavic languages for example and how, different, how, how the word kind of changes across the different languages in the Slavic or the Turkic family of languages. We can do that once we have the data structured. We can ask questions like, what is the longest word in our language without repeating letters? 
that's kind of a silly question, maybe, but it's a you know it's a difficult question. I mean, you know, can you think of that answer? You have to start imagining all the words you know. But Wikidata can tell us if we taught it, right? If we put our language in, Wikidata can just find us that word. And it can tell us what percentage of the words we use are borrowed from another language. All kinds of questions like that we could start asking. We could also ask, what are some false friends between our language and another language? False friends are words that sound like you understand them. You think that you know what they mean, but they don't. Right? Like just on the trip over here, we learned that in Azerbaijan, planes crash, right? Instead of landing... Right, the, the the word the word that that means landing in Azeri sounds like crashing in Turkish. It's not that they crash, right? It's it's just that it's a word you think you recognize as a Turkish speaker, but actually it has a different meaning in Azeri, slightly different meaning. So these are false friends, right? Words that we think we understand, but uh, actually have a different meaning. And we can also draw ourselves a little um, kind of selection of how this word has changed over the years. You could, for example, take a word and trace it through example sentences, how it has changed in meaning from, for example, Ottoman Turkish to modern Turkish, for example. What if we could do all of that? Is, wouldn't that be amazing? Guess what? Lexeme can do all of that right now. You knew this was coming, right? So, in fact, let's go one step further. Wouldn't it be nice if everyone could speak your language? That would be great, right? Well, until that happens, uh, I haven't started working on my Turkish, so, you know, until that happens, um, wouldn't it be nice if you could benefit in your language from content that was written by people who don't speak your language automatically? like machine translation, but more intelligently. So actually, this is where you go, what? Asaf has lost it completely, right? It's been a long conference. Uh, no, actually, I haven't lost it. Actually, have you heard of abstract Wikipedia? That's exactly what it is what it wants to be. It isn't yet. We're working on it. But Abstract Wikipedia, the, the newest project of the Wikimedia Foundation, wants to create abstract Wikipedia articles made up of code, of computer programs. But those computer programs will express the content in an abstract way. And then, once we have an abstract representation of knowledge, plus structured data about all of your languages, we can generate well-written, idiomatic, grammatically correct articles with that abstract knowledge in your language, not with a statistical approach, with an actual approach that imitates human sentence construction. Because our structured data allows us to pick the correct form in the correct sense, etc. Okay? So maybe until now you've heard about abstract Wikipedia and maybe you didn't really know what it means. Now you know. That's the dream. Right? Once we do that, and we're still working on the technology, but once it's ready, maybe in a year, maybe in two years, not much more, I think, we should be able to begin getting excellent correct, grammatically correct, well-styled knowledge in your language written by other people. Not machine translations, or it will also be machine, but not with the standard machine translation uh, approach. And it will be accurate, and you'll be able to edit it. You'll be able to edit the abstract version and correct it for everyone else in other languages, which is kind of amazing. So yeah, abstract Wikipedia absolutely depends on this structured data of your language. And it will do this for languages that are described well, and it won't be able to do it if you don't describe your language in structured data. Lexeme, what we're talking about today, is fundamental to that future with abstract Wikipedia. Okay, 
you've been talking for a long time about lexeme and you haven't shown us anything. So what is the actual lexeme? Like I said, it's another layer on top of Wikidata. It's running in the same site, the same software as Wikidata. And it's a different kind of Wikidata entity. Until now, we've only known items that start with a Q and properties right? that start with a P. So now we're learning about a new thing, lexemes that start with an L. Lexemes start with an L. They're not named after another wife of Denny Vrandecic. Uh, he still has just Kamara. Um, L for lexemes, right? Lexemes look like L, 3, 4, whatever. And again, we get all the benefits of the wiki, talk pages, history, etc., etc. We can link into commons. Uh, all of that. We can use the Wikidata query service, our new best friend from this morning, right, uh, to query those lexemes. And, like I said, lexeme is new, relatively new. It is still a very small community. In some of your languages, you may well be the first person to be interested in lexeme for your language which is fun. It's nice to be there at the beginning. You get to make a lot of big decisions, and the community is very small and friendly because it's small. We, we know each other. All the people who kind of deal with Lexeme at the moment kind of know each other and uh, are very friendly. So, in short, Lexeme is love, just like Wikidata. And now it's time to take a tour of Lexeme, but is it also time for a break? No, we have a few minutes. Yeah. So let's take a quick look, a quick tour of Lexeme, just like we took a tour of um, uh, items. So let's look at this Lexeme. And, and, yes, this Lexeme. So as you can see, this is Wikidata. Um, maybe it doesn't look like Wikidata to you because it is on my non-volunteer account and I put a color here just to remind me that this is my staff account. But ignore the color. This is Wikidata. This is standard Wikidata as you know it. And we see something that looks very much like a Wikidata item, right? It has a title and it has statements. But you notice that the title doesn't have a Q number. Ah! Yeah, it doesn't have a Q number, it has an L number. And this is the English word let. Let. And what we know about it is that it's from the English language, and we have a lexical category for it. That's what your teacher may have called parts of speech. Right? Noun, verb, adjective, preposition, adverb, conjunction, etc. Right? So in this case it's a verb, it's an English verb, to let, right? To let to let someone do something, etc. And what do we know about this lexeme? First of all, we have some statements about the lexeme in general. And in general, it's an instance of an irregular verb. Why is it an irregular verb? Because the past form of let is let. Right? We don't say letted. We said, I let him do it, right, in the past. So it's an irregular verb, okay. And we have some usage examples that we're going to skip for a moment. And we know that it's derived from another lexeme. What lexeme is it derived from? It's derived from the Middle English, the medieval Middle Ages English, uh, lexeme Latin. And we can click through, like you do on Wikidata, and you can see one day you'll be able to see. Yes, you can see that there's a different lexeme called Latin, and you can see that that language is different. It's not English, it's Middle English. It's Medieval English. And that's also a verb, you know, in Medieval English. And you can see that that verb is described by some Middle English dictionary at some URL. You see it's described by the Middle English dictionary. 
And um, let's go back to let. I just showed you that it's linked to some other lexeme. It's also a homograph of another lexeme, also spelt let. That's why it's a homograph. It's spelt the same as another word let. And that's the noun let. But never mind that. We have an external ID for this lexeme. An external ID, in this case, to the Oxford English Dictionary Online. Right? So the Oxford English Dictionary Online describes the verb let under ID 107496. And if I click through, if I click through, I can see uh, it didn't work because of the redirect, I guess. But anyway, it takes me to the Oxford English Dictionary site, supposed to take me right, right to that word. Moving on. So these were general things we say about this word. Now, remember we said we want to separate the different senses of the word. So let. You probably know this word, if you know this word. You know it in the sense of to allow, to permit, right? To let someone do something, right? To let the dog out. And that is indeed one of the senses. You can see here under the title senses... You can see the number of the lexeme, L4177, hyphen, S1. First sense. And the first sense in English is to allow, not to prevent. Right? That's the meaning. Now, look what happens here. We have statements about this sense. Not about the whole lexeme, because remember, the lexeme might have more than one sense. So here we have a, a statement about this sense of the lexeme, the sense of permitting. And the statement is that there is a synonym for this word, right? A synonym, a word that means the same thing. And the synonym is to permit, right? To permit, to let, they're synonymous. Great, but this is a synonym only of this sense, it's not generally a synonym of this lexeme because, as we agreed, words can have more than one meaning. And in this case, and some of you may not know this because it's less familiar to non-native English speakers, the word let also means to rent out property, to let an apartment, right, in English, especially in British English. Americans don't say that much, right? They say to rent, to rent out. But in British English, you might say to let an apartment, to let a flat, to let a house, to let a car. Um, so that's another different sense of the word to let. It doesn't mean to permit. It means to have a business transaction that's, you know, that gives you temporary use of a house. So you can see this is S2. It's a different sense. Yes, you have a question. Microphone? Yes, go ahead. It uh, looked a little bit similar to a uh, Victionary to me, and I really wonder if there is a relationship between Wikidata to Victionary, like Wikidata and Wikipedia. Yeah. And this is the first one you can answer, and I can ask the next What's one. What's the second one? Second one is, um, for example, some words, cat, has a, a Wikidata item with QID and mm. Lexin, because it's also a word yes. with LID. So yes. how I will search in the same domain, because it's in the wikidata.org, so how I will know which cat I am looking for. It was the second one. Excellent question as well. So to Wiktionary, we will get a little later. So. Yes, Wiktionary, some of you may know, we already have a dictionary project called Wiktionary. But Wiktionary is... Uh, running on the same software as Wikipedia, right? It's a wiki software. So when you edit Wiktionary, you get an empty, you know, rectangle, and you have to start typing your dictionary entry. However, unlike an encyclopedic entry, which is basically a story, right? It, it tells you about a, a subject in paragraphs of text. A dictionary, by nature, is much more structured, actually, 
If we look at the, at the paper dictionary, it's quite structured, right? There's the head word, and then there's grammatical information, and then there's meanings, and they are numbered, and maybe there are example sentences, maybe there's even a table in some dictionaries, right, that shows me the forms. It's actually, more, by nature, less of a free text and more structured. However, the software that Wiktionary had to work with when it started more than 10 years ago, there was no Wikidata, there was no Wikibase software, was the default Wikipedia software. So the Wiktionary people did what they could using very sophisticated templates to create that structure in an artificial way. And if you look at a Wiktionary page on English Wiktionary, you will see it is a lot less friendly to edit than Wikipedia because it's full of those tiny, complicated templates that they used in order to create a nice, tidy, structured dictionary page. In other words, Wiktionary is not a good fit technologically to the task of presenting a dictionary, but that's what we had, so that's what we used for many years. Lexeme is what Wiktionary always should have been. Lexeme is finally technology that is designed to capture knowledge about words in a structured way. And then, yes, you can present it in all kinds of forms. But Lexeme itself, like Wikidata itself, is just about capturing the data. Right? Afterwards, you can build on top of Lexeme a dictionary site, for example. In other words, one day we may see Wiktionary be powered by Lexeme. Or we may see other sites uh, kind of uh, compete with Wiktionary using Lexeme. That's in the future, and there are a lot of complicated questions about how and whether we could import data from Wiktionary into Lexeme, and we won't go into them right now. Again, happy to talk to you during the break. Your second question is very important, especially when we will want to contribute data to Lexeme. We will want to check that the word doesn't already exist there, right? So if I'm looking for cat, you gave the example. If I just type cat, I'm going to find... You know, house cat, computer tomography. I'm, go I'm finding Q numbers, you see. I'm finding Wikidata items. That's the default. That's what Wiki Wikidata will usually search for because that's what people are usually looking for. Usually they're looking for the item, the concept, not the word about the concept, the term. So the way to tell Wikidata, no, no, I'm actually looking for the Lexeme cat. I'm looking for the word cat is to, in the search bar here, to use L, L for Lexeme, colon, and then type the word we want. Now I typed cat, and it said no match was found. This is a lie. <laughs> Wikidata is lying to you. There is a bug. There is a problem currently in Wikidata that it doesn't, you know, the, the autocomplete or auto search isn't working for Lexemes yet. Theoretically, it should have told us, yeah, I know a Lexeme about cat. So right now, until they fix that bug, don't believe this and press enter. Okay? Don't believe the auto search. Do the actual search. When you press enter, you see, aha, it did find a lexeme called cat. By the way, an Irish lexeme, not an English one. An Irish lexeme, but it also found an, an English verb, cat, to cat. Uh, but it also found a cat in interlingua. Ah, here we go. It found a cat in English. That's a noun. That's probably what I was looking for. And it's L7. It's the seventh lexeme ever, right? <laughs> so, you know, they started out and they were like, okay, what words do we need? Cat, definitely cat. <laughs> exactly. So, here we have the lexeme about cat, the English lexeme. Okay, so we got it. We have to just say L colon. By the way, that uh, is not localized yet as far as I know. So even if you're searching for a word in, say, uh, Kazakh, in Kazakh script, you have to start with English, L colon. Then you can switch to Kazakh script and look for the word. Okay? All right. Thank you for that question. We need to go back. Yes, we need to go back to let. There we go. Okay, so we saw the senses, right? There's one sense uh, that's... Uh, permitting, and then there's another sense that's renting out, um, and there's even a third sense 
The third sense of the word let is to encourage yourself or someone else, right? Like, let's go, right? That's a different sense of let. It's not to permit. When you say let's go, you're not giving permission, right? When you say let's go, you're saying, hey, right? You're encouraging people to go. It's self-encouragement. Or, uh, let me help you, right? Let me help you. Right? I mean, technically, originally, that does come from permit. Right? When I say, let me help you, I'm saying, permit me to help you. Right? But let me help you. Uh, let me drink my coffee first. You know, I'm not ac- asking permission from anyone to drink my coffee. I'm just kind of encouraging myself. Oh, you know what? I'm going to do that. Let me drink my coffee. So that's a different sense. It's a third sense of the verb to let. Maybe when I started talking about let, you thought it only had one sense, to to allow, to permit. Actually, it has at least three. And these are only three I thought of. I created this lexeme. So, okay. What else? That's it. We're we're done with the the senses, the meanings of the verb let. Now we're ready to talk about the forms. The forms of the verb let. The verb, the word, or the verb. Make up your mind. Not warb. The word or the verb. Yes. So, uh, in some languages, you have a lot of forms for a word. Because it can be in the genitive plural. And it can be, the verb can be in the subjunctive or whatever. English is pretty simple in terms of forms. So, actually, we have one form, let, which is grammatically simple present. And we have another form, let's. Like, he lets the dog out, right? Third person, simple present. And we have the participle, or the gerund, letting, right? They are letting, we are letting, etc. And then there's the past, which irregularly is also let. You see, this is already the fourth form of this word. And lexeme knows all the possible forms of this verb. And then there's the past participle, which also looks like let, because it's an irregular one, right? But if it were do, we would see do, did, and done, right? Three different forms. Anyway, so these are the forms, and they have some description there. But for the first form, we also have some statements. Again, both the lexeme as a whole, and each of the senses, and each of the forms can each have their own set of statements, Describing them. Data describing data, right? So here we have a pronunciation audio of this form, let. You agree? It has to be on the form because the other form was letting. It's not the same. I have a pronunciation of let, not letting. So it's under this form. And we can listen to it. Did you hear that? That was. Let. 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 Right? Some lady saying let. And you can see that it's coming from a file. It's a file on commons called ENUS let. So it's an American woman saying the word let. You can click it and you're on commons. That's where this audio file lives. But it was linked to the Wikidata lexeme about let. Just like an image from commons can be linked to a Wikidata item. Right? Link data. Now, not only do we have a pronunciation, we also have a sub-property. We have a qualifier here that says the language of this pronunciation is... It's hard to read because it's so zoomed in, but the language is American English, right? The lady was clearly American. So, you know, someone else might add another pronunciation file in British English of how you say let in British English, right? Uh, We also have an IPA, International Phonetic Alphabet Transcription, of how to pronounce the word. That helps some people, and it can help people when there isn't a recording, right? And if we have time, after the break, I will show you how you can record recording uh, uh, pronunciations of words in your language that will be automatically connected to lexeme. And that's really fun. But anyway, this is it. This is the end of the lexeme. It's not as big and complicated as a Wikidata item. Um, Of course, in some cases, for some words, there's a lot more to say. This was just an example I made for you. 
Uh, I just want to show you that, of course, this exists for other uh, languages. For instance, I could look for the lexeme vada, and I can find it in Serbian, in Russian, in Church Slavonic, in Bulgarian, etc. You know, I can find all, all kinds of lexemes that all look the same. And if I look at the Russian lexeme, I can see that it's an instance of a noun. I can see that it's described by this dictionary, in this volume, in this column, in this publication date. You can see that this is a richer lexeme. And it's also described in some other things that don't have an English label, probably have a Russian label, right? That's why they're appearing as Q numbers. Uh, and it's a feminine noun, right? Water. And we have a usage example. Oh, I forgot to show you the usage examples. I'm sorry. Let's go back to let real quick. And then we'll break. So usage example. Now that we know the forms and the senses, we can make sense of this usage example. You can see this first sentence. Oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. So this is a line of poetry by George Matheson. And you can see that it has the author. And it has a reference that shows where I found this line. And I found it in English wiki source, right? On some literary text on English wiki source. But importantly, I'm also saying this usage example is demonstrating the sense of to allow. Remember, we said different senses need different example sentences, right? So in this example sentence, we see the sense of to allow. In this other sample sentence, this is a quote from T.S. Eliot, let us go then you and I when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. The amazing opening to the song, uh, the poem, the, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, comparing the evening night to a patient on an operating table. And, uh, of course, the, the example here is that he says, let, let us go, right? It's that third sense, right? The sense of self-encouragement, right? And that's what it says here. It says this is what we're demonstrating. And there's a third example. She had taken her passage for Europe and was very anxious to let the flat before she sailed, right? To rent out her apartment before she sailed. So that demonstrates the second sense. Uh, and you can see that this, the usage example is at the lexeme level, not the forms, not the senses, but it says what sense it refers to. Okay? All right, we're out of time for this session. We'll take a break, and then we'll see how we contribute to Lexeme and some awesome things that were built on top of Lexeme. Continue uh, our tour of Lexeme. So I hope that by now I have convinced you that Lexeme is worthwhile, that there's a point to doing all the work. And it will be a lot of work to document our language, our languages on Lexeme. I hope some of this, all this uh, uh, explanation about complexity and about what we might do with Lexeme has convinced you it's worth investing in documenting our languages. By the way, the smaller your language community, the fewer speakers you have, the more important it is that you document your language on Lexeme. The best thing that can happen to minority languages, to smaller languages, is to be documented on Lexeme with sound, with forms, with meanings, with usage examples. It's the best thing that could happen to a smaller language or a language that is under cultural pressure from a larger language like many of the languages uh, of Russia, for example, that aren't Russian. So, okay, so I hope you are convinced, but you have a lot of questions. For example, how do I know what already exists in my language? Where is Mohammed from Iran? Still on the break? That was his question. Okay. <laughs> How do I know what already exists in my language? So the next topic is how we browse 
Lexeme, how we look around Lexeme. And the first tool I want to demonstrate to you is called Hungor. And these tools, these are all links. So again, as usual, I will share my slides. You will be able to click on the links. Don't worry about it. This is the tool Hungor. Um, and one day, yes. Okay, so you can see the top 20 languages in terms of number of lexemes. And the top language is Russian with 101,000 lexemes already in Wikidata. That's a lot of words. Why are there so many Russian words? Is it because there is a very large active community of Russian lexeme editors? No. It's the result of one person's work, user Yurik, some of you may know him, Yuri Astrakhan, who is a programmer and who wrote a tool called the Lexicator to carefully pull data from the existing Russian Wiktionary into Lexeme. So I want to stress this 101,000 figure is no indication of community size, of community strength in Russian. It's just a massive program that took non-copyrightable material from Russian Wiktionary because not everything is non-copyrightable and Lexeme is on Wikidata and Wikidata is in a CC0 license right? so we cannot use material that is CC BY right? that requires attribution and Wiktionary is CC BY SA like Wikipedia so if we take things from Wiktionary we need to attribute them to Wiktionary, to the authors, right? So that's why he did not take copyrightable material. Now what is copyrightable material? To say that, uh, I don't know, Voda in Russian is feminine is not copyrightable. It's a fact. It's just a fact. It's not someone's creative act, right? It's not that you might say it's feminine and I might say it's something else and it's a, a fruit of my intellectual, you know. No, it's just a fact. It's like saying Moscow is the capital. It's uncopyrightable. Facts are not copyrightable. So the form of the language, the fact that it's Voda and then Vodou, and you know, the, the, the forms of the language is, are not copyrightable. We can copy them, we don't need to uh, give any credit or anything. And that's what he did. He basically parsed the Wiktionary pages only for the forms. He didn't take the senses, because the senses, when you explain a word, that's already a creative act, right? You can explain it one way, I will explain it a different way. Arguably, that's copyrightable. And the usage examples, of course, are complete sentences, also copyrightable. So he took what he could, mostly just the forms. Sometimes there was a pronunciation file so he could link it. So it was a, a careful mass import, but a very shallow one. Shallow. So those lexemes, those Russian, those 101,000 Russian lexemes, let's look at them. We can click the language. And then we can start browsing the words that exist. And you need this tool because it's a lot harder to do on Wikidata itself, right? Wikidata itself doesn't show you this dictionary-like view. So that's what the tool is for. And we can see, I don't know, the word uh, Absatz. I guess it means paragraph, right? From German. Uh, we can take this, this word. <clears throat> and it's a bit slow. I'm also going to start something else while we're waiting. It's more than a bit slow. Okay, let's also demonstrate Ordia. So while it is loading, I'll demonstrate another tool called Ordia. And you can use it, uh, you can click Languages, and it shows you some statistics about languages. It also shows you that Russian has the most lexemes. And then Estonian, a tiny language with one million speakers, one million speakers, has more lexemes than English. 
on Lexin. That's how early days we are, right? That a few uh, enthusiastic Estonians also did a mass import and they have more lexemes than English uh, on Lexin. Uh, and then after English, Malayalam, it's a language of South India and Swedish and Latin and Hebrew and German and Spanish and Basque. So you can see it has nothing to do with the size of the community of speakers, more with the enthusiasm of the few early volunteers. So your language can easily uh, become one of the top 20. Anyway, if we click Russian here, ah, there we go. This is ready now. See, it shows us the Lexeme Abzatz. And you can see it shows us all the forms, right? Abzatz, abzatza, abzatsu, etc. Right? It shows us the grammatical forms of the various cases in Russian. And you can see that this is a lot nicer to look at, right, than Wikidata. Wikidata wasn't designed to look like a dictionary. This is a little closer. But this is already an example of an application built on top of Lexeme. We put the data into Lexeme, like we do in Wikidata, with properties and values and things, and then someone can program you know, a view, a way to consume this data that's more human-oriented and less computer-oriented. And this is still, of course, very, very simple. Uh, it's just a, it's a very simple tool, and uh, some, some love from a programmer can really make it even better. So it shows us all the forms, and it, this one actually does have uh, the senses. You see, we have some senses here, uh, but nothing else. No pronunciation, no references to other dictionaries. That's what the import brought, and almost all of these 101,000 words in Russian are like this, right? They're like stubs. But you, you saw Voda was more detailed, right? So this tool just allows you to see how many words are in a particular language. You can see that Turkish is not among the top 20 languages. Uh, I think nor is any other language in the room, right? Yes, no, no other language in the room. What? No, not Persian, not Azerbaijani, not Italian. Yes, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. And Hebrew is here. And is it because there's a huge group of Hebrew lexeme editors? No. no. It's not because of me. It's because of a colleague of mine from the Hebrew Wikipedia who did the same thing, who did a massive import. In his case, it was not from Hebrew Wiktionary. Our Wiktionary in Hebrew is very small. Uh, he did it from a spell checker database. There is a free software Hebrew spell checker database that knows all the forms, not just uh, you know the lemma of the word, but also all the different forms. So he took that and mass imported it into 29,000 lexemes. And the Hebrew lexemes, just like the Russian lexemes, are not very interesting at the moment. Okay, they're not very interesting. So it needs a lot of work. So anyway, these numbers don't mean much is what I'm saying. You, you just can use this to see what exists in your language. And uh, we can look at Turkish. Turkish, Turkish. Turkish is not there? Tajik, yes. Do we have anyone who speaks Tajik here? Yeah? Oh, yeah. I was answering your question earlier, but you weren't around. <laughs> but, but this is the tool. This tool that I'm showing is how you look at the words that exist. It's called Hangor, and it's linked from the slide. So, uh, yeah, but it is a bit slow, unfortunately. So it's... No, I think it should give me all the words uh, in Tajik as well. Oh, you know what I can do? I, I can just browse. What's the language code for Tajik? TJ? TG? There we go. Okay. Okay, so we have some things in Arabic script, some things in Cyrillic. Uh, but yeah, it's very easy to browse because there's fewer of them. I don't know, what does this word mean? Argument? Argument? Who knows? Who knows this word? 
Anyway, I just picked it at random. So yeah, there are some Tajik words here. You see, it doesn't even have any senses or any forms. Someone just uh, you know, created, created a lot of really flat lexemes with nothing in them. In other words, like I said, it's early days and it's waiting for you, all of you, to start documenting your languages. Now I want to show you, in Russian, you can see in Ordia, the other tool, you can see that it has 101,000 lexemes, but only 11,000 senses, right? Only 11,000 senses, so about 10% of the lexemes maybe have one sense, right? And probably some of the words have more than one sense, so even less than 10% of the lexemes have any senses. You can, again, you can see how flat it is. Without looking one by one, I have these statistics. By the way, they are generated by a Wikidata query. You can click here to actually see the Wikidata query that generated these statistics if you want to learn how to do statistics about lexemes. And you have here just some examples of the lexemes and you can search them. And you can also see a bubble chart of what kinds of lexemes they are. And you can see that our friend Yuri Astrakhan has imported basically only nouns. 101,000 nouns, or maybe 100,000 nouns, and then there's like a thousand other uh, words of other kinds, right? There's adjectives here, here on the side. That, this tiny thing, there are 75 adjectives. Of the 101,000 words in Russian, only 75 adjectives are known. Have I said it's early days? It's early days. So there's a lot of room for you, even on Russian, there's a lot of room for you to create words that it doesn't know yet. It basically only knows nouns at the moment. Um, yeah, you can see the counts here. And 58 verbs, only 58 verbs in Russian. So even in Russian, you can still teach a lot to Lexeem. And of course, you can start uh, adding content to those nouns that have almost nothing in them in Russian. But I encourage you to work on your own languages. Uh, here are the longest words. That is a really long word. Um, and yeah, anyway. Um, I don't want to go too deeply into this. Um, it has, you can explore this tool, it can show you all kinds of graphs and statistics and things. I want to get on to more exciting things. Uh, there is this page which tries to assess how well covered your language is relative to a textual corpus. So for example, we can go to Turkish and see that in all of uh, um, Wikidata, we have 40 Turkish forms. Just 40. In other words, basically nothing. Nobody has even started really seriously working on lexemes in Turkish. Hakan created these words some years ago. And you just created a word? 43. 43 now, okay, excellent. Yeah, this report is from a few days ago. Uh, but anyway, you can see the corpus that it's comparing to. So just, to, just to, give a, to get a sense of how well covered the language is already, they took uh, Turkish Wikipedia forms, like text from Turkish Wikipedia, and they asked, oh, this word in this form, do we know it in Lexeme or not? Right? That's, that's what this means. So there are 151,000 different forms that they took from uh, uh, different forms. Not, not the total number of words in Turkish Wikipedia, the total number of unique words, right? Without repetition. In uh, Turkish Wikipedia, um, which have together 30 million different forms, and um, how many do we cover? 32. 0.0%, 0, 0. 0%, almost 100% missing, right? But if we go to, say, uh, Hebrew, and we compare the coverage in Hebrew, you can see that there are already 348,000 forms, not lexemes, forms. Remember, a lexeme can have more than one form. So there are 350,000 forms in Hebrew in Wikidata, and in all of Hebrew Wikipedia, they found only 250,000 forms, which means we have forms on lexeme that were never used in Hebrew Wikipedia. 
some rare forms of words, right? Uh, on the other hand, we're not covering all the forms that are used in Hebrew Wikipedia. We're covering about 21% of the forms in the Hebrew Wikipedia, which of course is not the whole language, but it's a good, you know, it's a good uh, uh, representative sample of the language. So again, this is a very rough report, but it gives you a picture. You know, you can really look at it and compare languages and get a picture of how well covered it is. And if you start working on your languages, you can come every month to this report. Uh, this is the report and see. Yes. Again. I wonder how uh, does this tool count, uh, for example, Turkish words, because uh, we have additional additions at, at, to the end of the word, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it makes it... It's very difficult, yes. Since the beginning, I wonder how I will add forms of a word, because yeah. I can generate many, many... So yeah, so I know. In, in Turkish and other highly agglutinative languages, it's quite difficult because you basically mash words together um, kind of as needed, right? You, have, you can put, I don't know, something like the, the man who turned right, right, can be like one word or something. Uh, which would be a phrase in English. So it's, it's difficult. It's, it's kind of ridiculous to make a lexeme for that combination because there's you know, a, a huge number of possible combinations. So this, I, I, you know, I'm not a, a Tur Turkish speaker. I can't give you concrete advice. What I can tell you is to consult with linguists, with people who understand how Turkish works and who could help you decide what should be a Turkish lexeme and what shouldn't. And obviously, in Turkish, it's not that only the smallest units deserve to be lexemes. Obviously, some constructions in Turkish deserve to be lexemes. Even the mek in yizmek is, is a component, right? It's, it's kind of a lexeme of its own. But we still want the word yizmek to be in, in obviously, right? So, so, yeah, I don't know the precise answer to give you because I don't speak the language, but people who uh, have some linguistic background, specifically in Turkish, w together with you as Wikipedia, Medians, after you kind of explain to them and show them and show them how it works in other languages, maybe you can find you know the rule of what to include and what not to include, right? Also, also Turkish dictionaries, printed dictionaries, can be a model for you. You know, would a printed dictionary have an entry for this phrase or not, right? And you can kind of use that to help you decide what to include or not. So let's create a lexeme. Right? Let's create a lexeme and actually enrich the Turkish, the, the poor Turkish uh, uh, coverage in lexeme. So uh, our lemma, our lemma is going to be the word yizmek that I have carefully prepared in advance. Uh, before we do that, we should make sure nobody has already created it, right? So we can search. We don't believe this that says no match. We press enter, and indeed, nobody has created this word. So I can click create <clears throat> and say Yizmek, and the language is TR, Turkish, right? And the lexical category for this <clears throat> is a verb, or it's an infinitive. Yes, it's an infinitive. Both. Right? Both. Both. Well, I mean, it's a verb, and then we can talk about the specific form. But it's a verb, right? So here I am creating this lexeme. ta -da! I have created how many percent of the total Turkish lexemes? Uh, uh, so now it has an L number, like a Q number, right? It has an L number, 717782, and in a minute when the search index updates, you will also be able to find it by searching, but right now you can already go if you want to the number. Okay, so it's Turkish and it's a verb. Now we need to say something about it. And we're going to say, uh, we're going to add a sense. And the senses, by the way, don't have to be described in the same language. <coughs> So I don't know how to define yizmek in Turkish, but I can define it in English, and then you can define it in Turkish. Okay? So I'm going to define it in, Tur in English as to skin, to remove skin. Right? 
Um, and by the way, this gloss, ideally you want to use more than one word. Why? Precisely because words have more than one meaning. Right? If you ask me, what does permit mean? And I tell you, oh, it means let. I didn't give you very good information because maybe you'll think of the right sense and maybe you won't. Right? So in these glosses, try to use more words, like you're explaining it to someone who's never heard of the word. Right? Don't just say, oh, this is that, because that may have more than one sense. So try to be uh, more, you know, I'm, I'm saying to skin, but to skin might have more than one sense, so I'm literally saying to remove skin. Okay. Mm. But that may be a different sense, right? This sense is skinning. We have an additional sense that means to behead. No, 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 no. It's skinning the head, just the head. Oh, okay. Okay, to, to remove the scalp, the scalp, the, the skin of the head. Right? Like, like Native Americans did? No, it's not like Okay, you will, need, you will need to figure this out. You will need to figure this out. We don't have enough time to figure this out right now. I want to demonstrate the, the function. So we have one sense in English. Later you can add explanations in your language. And uh, there was another sense, right? Which was to swim. Right? To swim. To move in water. Right? Again, I'm not just using swim. I'm just saying, ah, this is that. I'm literally defining it a bit. To move in water. Okay. Uh, and again, you can improve this later. I'm just demonstrating the, the idea. So we have two senses for this word at least. Maybe there are others we can add later. Now we should add the form. And every lexeme should have at least one form. Some lexemes have only one form. Like the word, the English word and you know, that connects sentences. That's it. Uh, and. It doesn't decline. It doesn't have any other, you know, it has one single form. And that should be okay. All right. So what, what forms do I add? When I add a form, it asks me, what is the representation, which is a linguist term for what does it look like on the page? How to spell it, right? So, yizmek, right? And the spelling variant I'm giving here is Turkish, standard Turkish. It has the option to include some other spelling variants. And the grammatical features of this form are what? Which form am I putting in first? Let's put the infinitive, right? You said it's also an infinitive. So let's call this infinitive. And you can see that you know, it gives me all kinds of things from Wikidata, like Avengers, Infinity War. You, know, you need to make sure, as usual in Wikidata, that you are picking the appropriate thing. In this case, the grammatical form, infinitive, and not the Avengers uh, or the mathematical concept of infinity. Right? You need to make sure you're clicking on the right things. Uh, and it's an infinitive. Does it have a tense? In some languages, you have like a present infinitive and then a past infinitive, which is different. Just infinitive, right, in Turkish. Okay, that's it, I'm done. Infinitive. So now we have L717782F1, seven, seven, form 1. And, uh, you know, again, you, you do the rest, you know, uh, the other forms of this verb in the past, in the present, in, uh, I don't know, uh, first person, third person. You can add this later, I'm not going to do it right now. And we can start adding statements. For example, we can add a usage example. Right? I mean, I can't right now. I don't have it ready with me. Um, oh, but maybe you sent me a usage example, right? The sense infinitive, the other sense not infinitive. That's fine. Oh, the, you mean in this verb? Yes. The first one is not infinitive. Oh, that's interesting. You cannot use it on its own. Uh huh. You need an object. No, what you mean is a transitive and intransitive verb. Yes. That's a different thing. Yeah, that's a different thing. Okay. Yeah. No. But but both of them have infinitives, right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you need an object and sometimes you don't. That's that's fine. I understand. I understand. Some not everyone is used to these grammatical terms, and that's okay. 
again, we have a community of Lexeme uh, speakers, uh, editors. On Wikidata itself, there's a chat page for Lexeme, specifically for Lexeme, and there's a very friendly Telegram group that's specifically for Lexeme, where you can ask these questions, and it has some bigger language experts than me uh, who can help you. Um, and again, among you, you will need to create this expertise. Don't do it yourselves. Do it as a group, you know, and, and involve a linguist and, and, I don't know, a professor, a teacher of the language to help you think through this, those things. I do, I am able to make high-quality linguistic, you know, determinations in English, in Hebrew, in ancient Greek, in Latin, the languages I speak, but I, I can't really help you in, in Turkish, I'm afraid. The point is, we have created a lexeme, and we, um, I, I don't have it with me right now. Bashak sent me a, a, a sentence, a usage example, uh, but I don't want to use too much time to just dig it up now. So you get the idea, right? Like I showed you. You can just cr create, you can invent a usage example, like a sentence that you invent, but actually it's better to have a source, like I showed you in let like actually show the literature, you know, how an author or a poet used this. It's better than just making up sentences of our own. It's also a little more interesting for the people reading the dictionary not to always read kind of very, uh, you know, default sentences like the man saw the house, the dog ate the food, you know, to actually give nice sentences from literature. And you can use uh, Turkish wiki source for that, wiki kaynak. Hmm? You can use, uh, um, you know, anything online. Yes, yes. Uh, you can use newspapers. You, you know, you can show how a professional newspaper used the word with a link, you know, with a URL to uh, where it was um, shown. So that's all I'm going to show you about the creation because it's very much like Wikidata. There are properties, etc., and you need to uh, do some exploration because I want to have a few minutes left to show you awesome tools. But first, a question. Yeah. So uh, I created the Azerbaijani version of this, the same word, Uzmek, but mm -hmm. is it possible to link uh, both versions to, like, Azerbaijani version to Turkish version? Yes. Yes, it is. Good can question. Can you Yes. So we can add a statement that says mm, why doesn't it have cognate form? should have had cognate form. Well, you can add translation statements. So you can say, for example, and in, in Azeri, it means the same two things? Yeah. Okay. So you can add a statement on this sense, and the statement can be translation. Translation. Here we go. And you can see that this is the right property because it says sense, meaning of a lexeme in another language that corresponds exactly to this sense. Because the idea is to connect sense to sense, not word, not lexeme to lexeme. As we saw, lexemes have different meanings. So we want to say sense 3 of this lexeme is the same as sense 1 of that other lexeme in another language. And maybe in the other senses they don't match, right? I mean, you know, uh, dog is, uh, I don't know, sobaka, right, in, in uh, Ukrainian, but to dog someone is not the same word in, in Ukrainian, right? So, let's say translation, and it is a translation of Yuzmek. Why doesn't it find it? Ah, Yuzmek. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea how to do that. Okay, we're running out of time. I'm sorry. So I, I won't show this. I won't show this right now. We can do it in the break. I want to still have time to show you one or two more things. Um, this is a list, a slide. We won't have time for all of them. But it's a list of slide of tools, tools that help you contribute to Lexeme. The links are there. You can look at them and try to figure out how they work or talk to me tomorrow during breaks. I can show them. Uh, Lexeme Forms is a tool that is designed to help you feed in a Lexeme by giving you a form to fill. Like, what is the masculine plural form? And then you type it. What is the past tense third person? And then, so that's easier. Instead of you having to think about all the forms, you have like a little form to fill, and you just type simple sentences. As native speakers, it's trivial for you to do. Um, 
Orthohin is a tool for adding senses to lexemes that don't have senses. Um, I'm going to skip a few of them. Lingua libre is an awesome thing, and that's the one tool I want to demonstrate. Some of you may have already encountered it. Lingua libre is a tool made by French Wikimedians to easily record pronunciations and easily contribute them to lexeme. And I want to demonstrate that. So the rest of them we will have to talk about some other time. And I also don't have time to teach you how to query Lexeme, but you need to learn Sparkle, which you've already done, right? And then you need to steal, adapt queries, which I also taught you how to do. And if you click on that link, you will go to my page with some sample queries for Lexeme. Okay? So that's all I can do for you uh, today. And I just want to show you two things very quickly. The first is an example of an education game. This is a simple game called Der, Die oder Das. In German, nouns have gender and you have to know whether someone is, something is masculine, feminine or neuter. And if, if you are not a native German speaker, it can be very confusing. So this game, this little educational game, was programmed by someone from uh, Wikimedia Germany. Um, user Oregon, and she uh, simply shows you one word, Doppelhaushälfte, and asks you, is it he, she, or it? Masculine, feminine, or neuter? Der, die, oder das? And you have to guess, or you know, maybe you know, and you say, I don't know, D, and you click the button, and yay! It was D. It was feminine. I guessed correctly, or I knew. Um, and then you have Androhung, which is also feminine, but let's say I, I selected masculine. And now my results here, you see, I got zero points for that because it was incorrect. So you see, it's a very super simple interface. It could be made much, more ni much nicer, etc. But the point is, this is purely coming from Lexeme. It's simply a little simple query on Lexeme and showing you whether you got it right or wrong. You could do the same on your language if you have noun gender. To prove that to you, I made a Ukrainian version in like half an hour. Uh, I just took that code, changed the, the, the language code, you know, from the Q number of German to the Q number of Ukrainian, changed a few of the titles, and you see this now asks you, Vin vona vono, right? He, she, or it in Ukrainian. Super simple. So that's a, one quick example. And the other example is, yeah, so I want you to try and, and play with Lexeme, see if you like it, see if you can collect people around you who are interested in documenting your lexicon for all these good reasons. There are many tools and, and links to explore here. Um, I want to thank you for your attention, but if you have a few more minutes of patience, I want to demonstrate something really amazing, which is the lingua libre recording of words. To do that, we go to lingua libre, lingualibre.org, and I'm going to use my volunteer account. <clears throat> because that's where I have, uh, that's where I've already recorded, uh, uh, registered in Lingua Libre. So Lingua Libre, lingualibre.org, it's a site, it's a wiki, and also a special kind of site. It's not a Wikimedia project, it's a Wikimedia France project. And what you do, you log in, okay, you log in to the site. By the way, the site can speak other languages. Uh, I don't know if it speaks Turkish. Does it speak Turkish? Yes, it does. Yeah. So we can switch. There we go. The site speaks Turkish and it speaks Russian, so most of you should be covered, at least. Uh, I'm going to switch back to English so I can use it. Uh, so you log in on Wikimedia Commons because this is going to upload files in our name, in my name. Okay, so I'm logging into Wikimedia Commons. <sighs> yes, and I'm allowing Lingua Libre to represent me. It is safe, these are trusted people. 
Okay, I am logged in. Now I click record. I want your attention on this because this is something all of you could do right now, assuming there are any lexemes in your language. If there aren't any lexemes in your language yet, what are you waiting for? Go and create some. But I'm going to record in Hebrew, my mother tongue, and there are lexemes waiting to be recorded, so that will be your demo. So I'm clicking record. <clears throat> and then Lingua Libre says, okay, let's do a quick test to make sure that your equipment is working. So I click start test. I start the test. Say something, say something. And it played it back. You couldn't hear it probably, but it played back. Okay, so my microphone is working. I click next. Yes, and now it asks me who I am so that the recording has some metadata. So I can give um, my gender or I can choose not to. I can tell what languages I speak, where I live. I'm from Israel. What license I would like to use. Let's go with public domain. No need to attribute me or anything. And click next. And now it says, okay, what words would you like to record? Right? Because the whole point of this tool is that it shows you a word, you just speak it, and that's it. You don't have to open a file, save the file, name the file. It does all that for you. You just sit there like this, and you just speak the words that the program shows you. It's amazing. But to do that, it needs to get a list of words. And you probably don't want to re-record the same words that someone else already recorded, because you're trying to cover your whole language. There's enough for everyone, right? So uh, I'm going to record words in Hebrew, and I need to somehow generate a list of words. And the easiest way to do that, even though it's, it's complex, but it's easy, is to do it with a Wikidata query. So we click external tools, and now it tells me, okay, paste the URL of a Wikidata query that returns words. Now, don't panic, I have made that query for you, and that query is... Oh, I have too many windows. Uh, yes. Not this. Yes, that query is... Here we go. Here in this, uh, in this um, uh, slide, see that link? There's a link to a query. Let's open it. And you can see... That this query, we don't need to understand it. We don't have time to uh, explain it exactly right now. What we need is to see that after this language property, there is Q288, which happens to be, hello, Hebrew. Okay? And using this query, I'm, I'm just going to record um, five words right now, because we don't have time. So I'm going to limit the query to five. This is something we haven't learned today yet, but you can just limit the results of a query to only five items, even if there are more. So that's what we're doing here. And you can see that this query says, I don't want minus the ones that have a P443, which is pronunciation audio. That's what this query basically does. Ignore the rest, right? It basically says words in Hebrew that are nouns and that don't have a pronunciation audio yet. I click Run. And very quickly, Wikidata has found for me five words, like I asked, just five. There are more, but I asked for just five. Five words in Hebrew, I know you can't read this, that don't have a pronunciation yet. So I'm going to take this query as it is from the address bar, not the short link, okay, the, like the full, the full URL there. That's what I need. I'm going to go back to uh, Lingua Libre. Uh, 
Here we go. This. This is where I paste the link. Okay? Again, you don't have to understand the link. Just change it from Hebrew to uh, 256 for Turkish, whatever your language is. Right? So I'm pasting it. And this is the amazing thing. It runs the query. And ta-da! I have those words ready to record. Now, I could have selected 100 words. You know, so it would be a, a more effective session. We just don't have time, so we're going with five. But I could have selected the next 200 Turkish words that need pronunciation, and then I can just sit here and just read 200 words, and that's it. It is packaging and slicing and cutting and editing and sending it to Commons and linking it to Lexeme automatically. So, let's do this. I have the word list. I'm clicking Next. And now it is ready to start recording. I'm going to speak these five words. I'm asking for your total silence. Be That's your idea of total silence? Yeah, before you do it, I want to ask you one thing. <laughs> I wanted to ask you just one thing. Uh, is it for only for, uh, for Lexemes, or you can uh, re register also forms? Of only forms? Yes, remember, because, because the lexeme has several forms. You want to record the word letting and let. And, I mean, maybe that's a trivial example, but in some languages, uh, the, the, the consonants actually change. In Hebrew, the vowels always change. So, in, in, again, in Ukrainian, that's an example I can give you. Um, you, you have ruka, um, that's arm, but rutsi in one of the cases... The k changes to tz. You, it's hard to guess. It's hard for learners to, you know. So, yeah, you record, you can record each form, potentially. Okay, so, everybody ready? A few seconds of silence. I'm going to click the microphone icon, and I want you to see how I don't need to do anything. I'm just going to come closer to the laptop here, but I basically don't need to... Open files, close files, save files. I don't need to do anything. Just watch. Ofe, daf defan, depressia, dekel, atzot. That's it. You can breathe. Okay? So, I spoke five Hebrew words that were shown to me very clearly, very easy. You know, I was leaning to my laptop, but in your home you can sit like a king and you can just read these five words or a hundred words at the same time. And that's it. Now, the next phase is to verify it because while we were reading, maybe my phone went beep, beep, you know, or maybe I, I, my, my mouth stumbled and I mispronounced the word and that shouldn't be the recording. So, the next next phase is to verify that I'm happy with these recordings. And you can hear them here. Okay, so I can check that everything went fine. Sometimes I know in advance that, oh yeah, that word, I screwed it up. So I can just, if I want, I can just decide, you know what, don't, I unselect, I unselect the word uh, depressia. Right? I can. But actually these are all fine. So I'm going to select all of them. And that's it. The last button, you see the upload icon? This button, if I press it, will now start uploading these files with the proper name and the proper category. Category, Hebrew pronunciation, etc. onto commons. And after they are on commons, a friendly bot will come along and go, ooh, new Lexeme recordings, and will link them to the appropriate form in the appropriate Lexeme, and I didn't have to do anything to, to make that happen. Isn't that amazing? So we're going to press the button. Was that too dramatic? We are going to press the button. There we go. We're going to press the button. And the first one traditionally fails. I don't know why. It looks like a little bug. But you can see here, it uploaded four out of five. Fortunately, there's a retry button. I can just try again to upload that one that didn't work. And this time it did. That's it. That's it. Those five recordings are now on Commons. They are not yet linked to the Lexeme, because that depends on a bot. And the bot runs every few hours or something. So I cannot show you on the Lexeme that it already works. 
but, and that's it, we're done. We're, uh, this button just says record more words if I want to go on. Okay? But what I can show you, I can go to Commons and show you my latest uploads. <coughs> uploads. And you can see that my latest uploads are from one, mom one minute ago. You see? Yes. And they are the words that I pronounced. Yes? And you can see that my earlier uploads, this one that I was demonstrating last week, you can click this file. It's a pronunciation file on Commons. You can see that it's called Lingua Libre, Q9288, that's Hebrew. This is my username, and this is the actual word in Hebrew. Okay, so it, it, it generated that automatically for me. I didn't have to do anything for it. The audio is here, of course. But more interestingly, uh, I am credited. It says who is the user who recorded it. And you can see the usage of this file. You know that Commons page shows you where the file is used. You can see that this is used on Wikidata in this Lexeme 63671, which is indeed the Lexeme for this word, this Hebrew word. And if we look carefully in the forms, we see that it now has a pronunciation audio. Oh, sorry, this is too small. Yeah? We see under the forms that we have a pronunciation audio, the same file. Yeah? That I recorded. You can see the reference is. Uh, going back to Lingua Libre, you know, that kind of keeps a record of all the recordings where you could, for example, read that I am uh, male from Israel, etc. All that metadata is available to you in that reference. Uh, but the fun thing is that anyone who is now building, let's say, an educational game or a learning app or a flashcards app for the Hebrew word can automatically pick up this uh, recording that I made for him. And I never edited this page myself. You can look at the history, and you will see that the Lingua Libre bot is the last to edit it, and it added this pronunciation, pronunciation audio file, right? It was done for me. That, that is it. That is all we have time for. Uh, to show you. I hope that this is exciting and that you are going to start documenting your language on Lexeme. There's plenty of other tools, etc. But we're out of time. Thank you for your attention.